you. Thank you, I guess, Sabu, Sabu, uh, for inviting me. Um, this was nice because uh, when I was a graduate student, um, then at LIDS, at MIT Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems, very comparable to CSL, um, we also launched the student conference over there. So I was, you know, very active in the student conference. And as students, we would always get really excited, not just for ourselves when we present, but, you know, inviting people. So, so I was really happy to, to get this invitation. Thanks so much. Um, so, so I know the title says Smart EEG Analytics. Um, so maybe you're thinking there's going to be signal processing, machine learning kind of techniques there. And, and you'll be a little disappointed. It's really systems theory and control that I found after working on this problem for probably eight years that I found probably the most exciting type of results for a particular problem. So, um, so yeah, so please jump in. I don't think I'm going to kind of take this talk as a little odd for me because I'm kind of going in reverse order. Typically, especially if you do sort of systems theory or control, you formulate, you pose a problem. I'll definitely pose a problem. And then you approach, you show your approach and your solution. Maybe you prove some theorems, and then you show some application results. I'm going to show you and have you hope appreciate the clinical problem that we try to address. I'm going to go straight to the solution. I'm going to tell you what this thing does and how it works, and then I'll open the hood. Okay, so bear with me um, with that. But with that said, you know, feel free to ask any questions. Um, just as a disclosure, everything we talk about the technology, um, I did take a sabbatical for a year, three years ago, because this was the one thing I felt that I believed may work in the clinic. We published a lot of papers in this uh, problem, in this area. But, and there were some interesting patterns we would see in the data, but I would never take it to a clinic and say, use this. It's going to help. Accept this. So, um, so just as a disclosure, so this, I, it's a company co-founded with uh, a neurosurgeon, Jorge um, Gonzalez Martinez, um, who was the lead neurosurgeon at the Cleveland Clinic Epilepsy Center. OK, so let's get started. So what's the clinical problem? So just to bring epilepsy to the table, I know this is probably a more broad audience. So over 60 million people in the world have epilepsy. So patients who have epilepsy have what are called recurrent seizures. Seizures manifest as hyperactivity in the brain, hyperelectrical activity in the brain. They can last seconds, and you as an outside observer of a patient may not even know somebody's having a seizure. Um, because it just might just be simple auras or their eyes might flip up in their head, but to you, you may not even know they're having one. And it can go all the way to another extreme where it lasts for several minutes, and they might have convulsions and they fall on the floor. Um, so they vary in terms of, of severity and, and um, duration. This was surprising to me. I don't know if you know this, but over 30% of people who have epilepsy don't respond to drugs. It doesn't matter what cocktail of medication you give them, they do not have adequate control of their seizures. So just imagine you have this disease, you can't predict, maybe we can within a few seconds, but you certainly can't predict within minutes ahead of time that you're about to have a seizure, which means you don't get to drive. You shouldn't go into a pool, right? Um, you just have no medications to help you, right? You don't develop normally. And these are the most severe cases, so they typically have a high mortality rate um, and they die younger. However, um, there is a group of them, about half of these people who, who are drug resistant, drug resistant or have what's called medically refractory, um, have what's called focal epilepsy. So focal means there, is, there exists this epileptogenic zone. We're going to call it the EZ. Some might have heard this as seizure onset zone. It's, it's defined as the minimal area of the brain that I need to remove to stop seizures. It's never it's not necessarily like a golf ball that I just need to find and take it out. It can actually be complicated. A few little nodes that are connected to each other, maybe at slight distances, okay? But whatever the smallest amount I need to change, that region is called the epileptogenic zone. So for people with focal epilepsy that are drug resistant, you have a potentially curative uh, procedure, which is surgery. This is the most common thing which is if I can find this epileptogenic zone, I'll just surgically remove it, take out the tissue, and hope that the seizures stop, okay? Another treatment that was just FDA approved in 2015 is stimulation. So instead of taking out a big part of your brain, I'm going to find where the seizures start. I'm going to put a chronic implant 
subdural, so you can't see it, that's monitoring activity in the brain in that region. It has some simple algorithm, algorithms to try to detect when it's about to see a seizure, and then it just dumps current, charges it, bursts of current into that region of the brain to hope to stop that seizure, right? So it's kind of acting on that hyperactivity by dumping, providing this very fat, high-frequency electrical current input. Um, but both treatments, in order for them to work, you need to know where this EZ is. And I hope to you know, convey to you today that that is a really hard problem in many, many cases. Okay? And it's not surprising then that on average for surgery, you have about 50% success rate. So actually it's a highly variable success rate. Um, it can be in your best case scenario, 70% chance of seizure freedom or seizure control with drugs after surgery and it can be as poor as 30% success rate. But remember, these people will die if you don't treat them. So with that said, only 18% of people who have this focal epilepsy um, decide to go through this treatment. And it's, the outcomes is one reason, and another reason I'm gonna convey to you now, which is how they go about finding this epileptogenic zone. So if you end up having a seizure, and they've, they've determined, the clinician, that it's focal, they're going to say, you might be a surgical candidate, and here's what happens to you, okay? So first, what the clinicians will do, will try to figure out, pinpoint roughly where this zone is, or maybe exactly through non-invasive imaging techniques, okay? So they'll take PET scans, they'll do an MRI, they'll do SPEC scans. These are all different techniques to image the brain, the whole brain, okay? What they're really looking for, they're hopeful, hoping for, is in the MRI scan, where you see structure, they'll see a lesion something pathological. And if they see a lesion, that's called a lesional case. And in, those are the best case scenarios. Those are the guys who get the 70% success rate. Because most of the time, seizures are starting in that lesion area. OK? So, but half of the time, MRIs look normal. SPECT, PET, everything looks normal. They do scalp EEG, OK? And they have the patient sit in the hospital for several days, because they want the patient to have seizures so that they can record the scalp EEG during a seizure. And what do they do with that? Well, at least they can say things like, okay, we know it's in the left hemisphere. We know it's probably left frontal, right? But they'll never make a surgical plan on a scalp EEG, okay? Especially when your MRI looks completely normal, okay? So what that does at this point, if you don't have a, a lesion on your MRI and you kind of pinpoint the area with scalp, here's what they do. Then they go to a second phase of monitoring, and that's invasive. So what do they do there? Depends on which center you go to. You, might, you go in for an operation. So this is not the surgery to take out your epileptogenic zone, because they don't know where it is yet. This is a surgery to put electrodes into your brain, OK? So you may end up going in. One technique called electrocorticography is you start with a craniotomy, so they, they make a a hole on your skull, and they open the flap to expose the cortex. Once they expose the cortex, they will slip a grid of electrodes on the surface of the brain. That's what you see on the left. Another technique is stereotactic EEG, where they don't do this craniotomy. They just drill a bunch of holes and put depth electrodes into your brain, Okay, where each depth electrode will have multiple contacts. Each contact senses some voltage signal. But both are called intracranial EG within the brain. You recover from that surgery, okay, now. And now the patient sits in the hospital for several days, maybe even weeks. Why? Because the clinical team wants them to have seizures while they're there, okay? And then when they have the seizure, this is what they do. They have EEG technicians, neurologists, epileptologists, people who are expert at visually inspecting these EEG Looking at, you know, when a seizure, as you can see, by the way, this is a seizure. I think that's obvious here. This is right before seizure, that's a seizure. That's what the brain looks like when you're having a seizure, and then you can see when it stops. And what the clinicians will do is they'll say, okay, I see an electrographic seizure there. Let me go back a little bit, 10 seconds before, and see if I can find which channels have some pathological signature. Something, you know, it could be what's called low voltage fast activity something like this, or high frequency oscillations, or spikes, okay? So this is process is very, very tedious, 
okay, it relies solely on inspection, they actually don't have any analytical tools to help them interpret the data. What they do have in the clinic to help them is they get days of EEG recordings. Okay, days, that's a massive amount of data. And what they do have are tools that just sort through all that data and say, here's where I think an event has happened. Here's another event. That is done analytically. That's done through tools. But after that, it's all through clinicians looking at this, um, these data. So as you can see, it's not surprising. And by the way, um, after all of this, if they do lo what are they call localize or have a surgical plan, they tend to take out as much as they can. So the surg surgeon's goal is, I want to take out as much as I can without impairing the person, right? So they'll go beyond this EZ. They'll take out everything they possibly can because they know there's an error. There's a, a margin of uncertainty in how well they localized. So they don't want the patient to come back, but they don't want to impair their vision or their motor control and so forth. Um, okay, so what are the challenges here? Well, okay, for, by the way, to just find this easy, you have to hope that they put the electrodes in the right place. You cannot implant the whole brain. It's just not possible. So that's why they use that scalp EEG and the non-invasive information to help figure out, okay, if I can't implant the whole brain, where should I focus my, my energy on? Where should I put those electrodes? And so if they're not in the right place, you're done. You're not going to be able to find it. Prolonged hospital stay right now, because of the way uh, clinicians are localizing, they need to see seizures. And one is never enough. One is never enough because one, the, the patient might have what are called multifoci, meaning some seizures start here and other times seizures start here. And so they need to wait to have several seizures to become confident in their uh, localization, okay? Um, but this is really problematic for the patient because that's risky, right? You have a patient, in the case of the craniotomy, you have an exposed brain, right? And you're, you have a pretty good risk of infection there. Subjective decision criteria. As I mentioned, there's really no tools to help them interpret. The outcomes are really poor. After all of that, can you imagine what you go through to have a 30 to 70% range of success is really daunting. And that's why only 18% of people who have this disease opt for this treatment because of that. Um, high risk, high cost, okay. All right, so now I'm gonna go straight to what our solution, okay? So, um, so what we're saying is here is, okay, we have all kinds of um, time series data, okay? It can be scalp, it can be intracranial, we built this algorithm we call Easy Track, okay? And what it's gonna do from an input output description is it's going to take a time series window and produce a spatial temporal heat map. Very simple, okay? So if I put in a window of 10 seconds across 100 channels, I'm gonna get the same 10 second window across the same 100 channels. And the way you read this is probably exactly what you're intuitively thinking now, right? So anything that's red hot on the map we think is pathological. Okay, if it's happening before a seizure. And anything that's blue is not interesting. Okay, and the way to read this, so on the y-axis are the channels, the different, and when I say channels, each of those electrodes generates a signal, a time series. And, um, and so, so that's just the input output description. Is that clear? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna get there, so, so right. So it's not just a pure visualization of the data, number one. So what we're going to do is, we're, I'm gonna tell you, but I'll give you a high level here. So we take the data, I build a dynamical systems model of the network. So I wanna know how the activity in one contact influences the future activity of its neighbors. So dynamics in there, okay? And from that, I'm going to do stability theory because I think, I think a seizure, and we'll get there, is a network that's very, very close to being unstable, that small jitters and noise to the synaptic connections or the inhibitory inhibition and excitation of the brain will ultimately kick into a point where you are unstable. Therefore, if you get a perturbation at the wrong place, wrong time, you generate a seizure. So we'll get there. So yes, so this is what's kind of interesting, right? So I'll get there, um, but right. So. 
if we can avoid, and I think this is some of your work in your, that's happening here, is it would be great to just record maybe 10, five minutes when they're not even having a seizure and be able to say, where do they start? And actually, that's where, just think about that. If I just take 10 minutes of the data, when they're not having a seizure, how am I going to say where seizures start? I don't think machine learning or pattern record and any of that will work. Why? Because they need to see seizures to see the patterns. But systems theory may play a role. Because in systems theory, if I have a notion of what a seizure is, it's an instability, then I can do some interesting analysis on the stable model and figure out what's the smallest little kicks or perturbations I need to apply to which node to render an unstable network. So that's exactly where we're going. Okay? So, so some of these channels are spatially co-located, right next to each other. We can order them arbitrarily. It doesn't matter. The ordering doesn't matter. They happen to, yeah. Well, that'll just, it just changes it in the arrangement. So what you call channel one versus channel doesn't matter. It's just arbitrary. Okay. Um, let's see. So I'm going to show you some examples from snapshots of different patients with different outcomes, and then we'll get into what's inside. Okay. So here's an example of a patient treated at Cleveland Clinic. This was stereotactic EEG. So this is when you drill uh, electrodes on the side. So this is sort of a, a, a slice where the electrodes are going this way. Every sequence of dots is one electrode. Every dot is a contact. So you're going to get a signal out of every blue dot. Okay? And the clinicians thought that those five that I highlighted on the L electrode were pathological. Okay? So now we took a snapshot of their data. What you see here, this is before seizure. The red dashed line is onset of one event, offset of one seizure. So that's one seizure over there. And what you can see here is that there seems to be a, a reasonable agreement between this heat map and what the clinicians thought. Okay, because I see, so I don't know if you can see, this is red here. So those red rows correspond to where the clinicians thought the seizures were starting based on their standard care by visual inspection. And when you look at the map, there's some interesting agreement between that and the map. And this ended up, this was a success patient. This patient was seizure free after surgery. Here's an example, same Cleveland Clinic, same technique, where this was a failure, okay? So what happened here? So the top row, some of those rows that are labeled in red and in the rows, those are where the clinicians believed were starting seizures. So why did they think that? Actually, if you look at the seizure event, it's a little squished here, this is seizure. If you look at the top rows there, you see red, right? Right when the seizure starts. So clearly there was something there, and the clinicians saw that. But if you look at our map, we also see other channels that are pretty red right at seizure. But what's more interesting is this one contact, this W bar one, that's red minutes. It keep going hours before. Very, very pathological, OK? And so we're not saying, and, and, to, and this was a failed case. So there was a disagreement between the map and the clinician, and this was indeed a failure. Now, th what's really hard about trying to come up with assistive algorithms to help find where the seizures start is that there is no ground truth. So how do you evaluate? We're going to get there. It's really hard to figure out whether your algorithm works or not. The very first step is, do I agree with the clinician when they succeed? And do I disagree when they fail? Okay. So our hope would be that if we showed this map to the surgeon or the epileptologist, before they finish their plan, they might have gone back and said, wait a minute, maybe there is something in WBAR1. Let me go back to the EEG trace and see if I see anything. Why is the tool telling me that? That's how we hope that a clinician will interact with a tool like this. Yeah? Can you uh, describe what the color bar uh, here represents? Yes, yeah, so, okay. So the more red, the more fragile. So what I'm plotting here is what's called fragility of a, a node, okay? A fragility of a region in the brain at a given point in time, okay? So I'm, gonna, I'm going to get to fragility in a few slides as to what it is. But basically, the interpretation is the more fragile, the more likely you are in the epileptogenic zone prior to a seizure. So that's a quantitative measure? Quantitative measure, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So do you remember I showed you in the beginning, they, they're looking for signatures. So there are some indicators, okay? So for example, if I am not, if I'm just sleeping, and I have epilepsy, and I'm just sleeping, and you can record from various parts of my brain through these implants, there are going to be some abnormal spikes. They're called interictal discharges. So ictal means seizure. Interictal is between seizure, okay? They call these interictal spikes, meaning there's these abnormal sharp spikes that you don't see in a healthy brain in general, okay? Like in terms of just when you're sleeping, okay? So that, that is an indicator of a possible pathological area. So they look for stuff like this. It's hard. It's not easy to find these things, and, and it's not always the case that just because you have a spike that you're pathological. So that's why you see all kinds of errors here in the process, okay? There's no biomarker. There's no EEG marker. Um, yeah. A seizure in itself is very easy. You can just look at the data, raw so trace. Where, where? Because once you, if I get, to, I'll, come, I'll show you another example. You'll see again what a seizure looks like in terms of the raw EEG. Essentially, right after it starts, almost everybody gets entrained. The whole brain will attack. Maybe it depends if it's general or partial, but a good chunk of the brain will just respond to that seizure, and now you can't see what's who started it, right? You might just be a spread region, not the initiation region. And that's also another complicated. So this is one of the last examples I'll show you that will go into what it's doing. Okay, so this was interesting to us because we see, so we've done this on over at least 300 uh, events, okay, where we look at these maps. And we've gotten to a point where every time I see a map like this, so how is this different from one of the first ones? In the first ones, we saw a lot of blue with a couple of reds that popped out. Immediately, I can say that's a success, okay? But then when you see a map like this where everything's roughly orange and red, even if you can see something clear at seizure, and this is where the clinicians saw, okay, and they treated that area, they failed with this patient, look at the rest of the, what the rest of the recordings are saying. To me, this possibly means two things when I see an orange map. Either seizures are starting in very multifoci, so seizures can start from a lot of different places. This is not a treatable patient, okay? Uh, and they knew this was not a treatable. They, they just did something to try, okay, for this. Um, or the fact that it's all sort of every channel is roughly comparably fragile might mean that the, the implantation is off. So what I'm gonna show you, when I compute something fragility of the node, it's all a relative measure. So if I didn't cover the onset zone, I'm gonna get an orange map, okay? Just the way we compute it. So it could mean, it could get feedback to them, it's like, okay, this might, you might have implanted in the wrong place. And this is just, this was one of the ones I showed in the beginning. This was a nice, clean success, good agreement between the map and uh, the clinician. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into what, how we do this, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna show you is the mechanics, okay? So bear with me. The mechanics of how I go from a time series to a map, okay? And then once I show you that, I'm going to tell you how the colors emerge, which is how we compute fragility for every channel, everything, okay? So here was how we started with the concept. So we said, in, and this is a universally, I think, accepted by all the clinicians, um, is if you, are, have, if you don't have epilepsy, you have what's called a healthy brain, okay, which means it's balanced. So the brain is composed of populations of neurons, and neurons are typically excitatory, meaning they excite their neighbors, or they're inhibitory, they try to quiet their neighbors. And in a healthy brain, you have a nice balance of excitatory, excitation and inhibition. So if you apply some kick, so if I have a healthy brain and I'm, I get a visual stimulus, of course my brain is gonna to respond to that stimulus. Neurons will fire, right? But then there's enough balance that eventually it'll go back to rest or baseline, whatever that is, right? That's a stable network. Now, if you have epilepsy, so this is the trace, I think you were asking about the traces. This is um, when you have seizures. So the notion is something is imbalanced there, okay? Meaning that you know, there's some area or areas in the brain where you have either 
more or less inhibition or more or less excitation. So how would that happen? There's part of the cortex where you have pyramidal cells. Those are excitatory cells. We saw that if you look in rat models or you take slices of cortex of epilepsy, epileptic rats and you look at their excited, uh, excitatory cells, they, they actually have more excitation. So I don't know if you've seen a schematic of a neuron. It kind of looks like a, a trunk and branches. Those branches are called dendrites. Well, there's extra arborization in the pyramidal cells. These excitatory cells have more branches in an epilepsy brain, which means they excite more. They're more likely to cause an excitation or hyperactivity in the brain. Or what also has been shown in rat brain is you take the, the cells that are inhibitory, chandelier cells in cortex. These tend to quiet down. Well, they're dying in the epileptic cortex, which means they're the ones that are supposed to stop the excitation when it gets too much. And guess what? There's less of them. Okay, so there's just some imbalance going on. And so what we did is we said, okay, we said, okay, so then we think there are some fragile nodes in this network that are causing this imbalance. Okay, so what is a fragile node? A fragile, the fragility of a node, let's say I, is equal to the following. It's the smallest, let's say I have, I'm not having a seizure, so I'm stable. And I ask the question, okay, how much do I have to change node I's influence to its neighbors, okay? This is not structural connection necessarily, but sort of functional influence to its neighbor. What's the smallest little changes I have to make before the whole network goes unstable? If I can get, quantify that, that is the fragility of I. So if I have to just change those, if that influence just a little bit for node I, that is a very fragile node, right? But if I have to really, really you know, add a lot of changes to a node before the whole thing goes unstable. That's a robust node. Okay? So we're going to go into how to quantify it. And what we thought is that, um, so our hypothesis was the most fragile nodes are epileptogenic zone. Okay? So what we do is we're going to compute and quantify this notion of fragility from the EG recordings. So we do that first by building a model. Okay? I mentioned this earlier. So how do we build that model? Okay? So you can take every contact and label it as one, two, three. And we're going to say the time series that comes out of that con contact is xi of t. Okay? And the way I build a model is in a very small time window. Okay? Let's say 500 milliseconds. I have a vector x of t. Okay? And I'm going to build a very simple LTI model. LTI because it's a very small window. We had some work, prior work that shows that if I just in that small window, LTI is enough. I can beautifully reconstruct the data with an LTI model. Okay? So in that small 500 millisecond window, I estimate my A matrix, least squares, nothing fancy there. And then from that A matrix, I'm going to compute, it's a model now, okay, of the network, and I'm going to compute the fragility from that matrix. I will tell you how I do that next, but let me just go through the mechanics. Okay? Then I slide that window. I compute another A matrix, okay? And I, from that new A matrix, I get another column of fragility, and so forth. I keep moving. And so really what we end up building as a network model is a linear time-varying model. It's linear in these 500 millisecond windows, but the A matrix changes every window. Yeah? It, a, the A matrix is it's just the model, right? So X of T plus 1 is a vector. No, no, no. It's, it's a dynamical model. So it's saying X at time T plus 1 is A X of T. Okay? So it's generative. So if I have an initial condition for X, I can go through the recursion and compute a whole time series trajectory. Good. Well, because it's stable. Yes. But we're getting there. That's exactly right. I, the whole notion of fragility is I have a stable network, and I'm asking the question, what are the smallest changes? So I'm going to end up perturbing a column of A that corresponds to one node and how it changes the future of everybody else. I'm going to perturb it and ask, 
How small is that perturbation before the poles hit the J omega axis? So we're, you're, we're getting there. We're getting there. It's exactly right. But this is all stable now because I'm going to compute it off of the stable How recording. Do you measure causality? I don't need it. Well, it's just a, you're right. I'm just fitting a model to data. I'm fitting a model to data. I, and I don't need to know what's causing what. I'm just fitting a model to the data. It's causal by construction. That's what an x dot equals ax. It's causal by construction. And I'm going to try to analyze it. Okay. I'm not trying to build a model that's going to uh, really be generative and explain phenomena. It's just a, a simple phenomenological model. Regression. It's a regression. It's a regression. Yeah. So when you build this model, it's so, my understanding is the matrix A is uh, you extract out the data. Yes. How stable it is over time and then how yeah. the other, like, you know, when you look at the matrix, does it really conform with the understanding, like, nearby nodes that you know, have a model? No, because nearby nodes are not necessarily the most strongly connected nodes. Mm -hmm. Yes, in many cases. It depends which part of the brain is being covered. There are certain places where um, contacts are placed in two areas of the same structure that are densely connected with wires, right? They're physically connected, structurally connected. But then I have temporal pole in my brain that has huge projections to frontal cortex, far away. You'll catch that in the, in the A matrix. You'll see things like that. So the, this A matrix does not, it does not look like a DTI, a matrix, a structural connectivity matrix that comes out of diffusion tensor imaging of the brain. This is functional and it's dynamic, right? It's not a correlation matrix or anything like that. But it is just a regression. We're fitting the data, yeah. So is XT the time series or is it some? XT is the time series. It's exactly the time series I'm recording. Yeah, if I have 100 contacts, X of T is 100 by 1. Yeah. N would be the number of contacts. It typically 80 to 100, in, depending on the technique used. So these are 500 millisecond windows times 100. So yeah. Rated. Sample is rated like a, a kilohertz, two kilohertz. Yeah. Yeah? OK. So that's just the mechanics of how I go from time series to map. Now let's talk about the fragility. Okay. So I said before, I have this A matrix, and from that I can get fragility of all N nodes, okay? So here's what I do for the non-engineers, and then I'm gonna go into the, the stability problem. Okay, so here's what it is conceptually, okay? So let's take a two-node network, okay? Where I have an inhibitory node and an excitatory node. The model, the LTI model is on the left, okay? So from the inhibitory mo uh, node, since it's inhibitory, it has negative influence on its uh, excitatory neighbor and the reverse in excitation. And I have a nice stable network here. What do I mean by nice and stable? That if I were to kick it with a pulse, the inhibitory node, you can see on the right, this is all simulation, right? That it responds, the two signals respond to that kick to the inhibitory node, but they eventually goes back to baseline, goes back to rest. So that's a nice stable uh, system. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little perturbation, okay, to the A matrix, in particular to node 1. What am I, why am I doing this? Because I'm going to try to give you a, an idea of what the fragility of node 1 is. So I'm going to start, I start with the normal stable model. That's my original A matrix. That's what I'm going to estimate from the data that I just showed you. So I have a nice stable A, and I'm going to keep adding perturbations to that column. And in this case, I'm making it a little less and less inhibitory. And then I say, OK, what happens when I make that perturbation? OK, it's still stable, but I get a little bit of a larger response. OK? And if I want to compute how much of that change did I make, I just take the two norm of that column, square root of 5. I do it a little more, keep adding a little bit more perturbation. And now it was too much, in the sense that if I were to hit the inhibitory node with a pulse, I'm going to generate an instability seizure. OK? So what this is really about, what we ultimately solve for, is if you give me an A matrix, if I want to know the, what the fragility of node 1 is, 
I'm going to apply a perturbation delta to the A matrix where delta has structure. It's non-zero in the first column and zeros everywhere else. And then I ask the question, what's the minimum to induce norm of that delta such that I get instability, meaning I move the poles to the mar margin, okay? So this is sort of a visual of that. So for, I'm guessing most of these people are CSLs, so they know linear systems theory. So if, if you have an x dot equals ax or x of t plus 1 equals a, you can look at the, uh, when you talk about asymptotic stability, so asymptotic stability, it just says, okay, if I have x of t plus 1 is ax, I start my initial condition, x at time zero somewhere else, not at the origin, and you just let the system run unforced, does x of t go back to the origin, back to rest as time goes to infinity? That's asymptotic stability, if you can, go, you know, if you can say that for anywhere you start. So what sort of is a necessary and sufficient condition for asymptotic stability? All your eigenvalues are in the unit disk if you're discrete time, these are the models we're building x of t plus 1 equals axt. Or if it's continuous time, I think this is the schematic here, you're looking at the real parts of the eigenvalues of A to be in the left half S plane, complex plane. So if you have eigenvalues, so this is a sort of discrete time model, so I'm drawing the unit circle. And if, my, if I have an A matrix um, that has these eigenvalues, they're all inside the unit disk. So I'm going to get with, if I were to perturb it or change, make the initial condition non-zero, you will end up going back to rest, okay? And if they're outside this disk, you have instabilities. So what we do is we say, okay, if I start with a nice stable A, I'm asking the question, how much delta do I need to add before I cross that margin, okay? And so I can, and then that amount of delta, as measured by the two induced norm of that matrix, is the fragility. Okay, so that's how we quantify it, yeah. No, well, I'm going to show you how we solve it, yeah. Sir? Um, they, they're unitless, right? So I'm just asking the voltage, how it's evolving over time. The future is a function of the past. They're both in voltages, so this is unitless. Well, yeah, that's what we're asking. We're saying, how big does my delta have to be? Yeah. Well, we're not going to, I just showed you that as an example. We never do that to solve this problem. We're going to solve it through optimization. We're going to solve it through least squares. It's so easy. But so we're gonna, I'm going to show you that right now. It turns out to be a very easy problem to solve. Okay, so this is, yeah. Good. Yes. So yeah. So if you were to think of this as a time-varying system, it's a switch. It's switching, right? The A keeps moving. So yes. If I were to take a big chunk of data, what's and like say more than 500 milliseconds. Let's say I have 10 seconds. I've got 20 A matrices in there. Okay. No, this is not a theory that we'll talk about stability of in that long time frame. No. So yeah. So it's not necessarily guaranteed that I'm going to. Is that what your question was? My question is within 500 milliseconds, yeah. is it, uh, within the, are the brain much faster than that? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Neurons fire every millisecond. They can fire on a millisecond scale. Yes, for the level of neuronal firings and populations. Correct, exactly. No, no. These, so the, what I'm not showing you is how these models can actually reconstruct that data in the first place, that they're actually decent models at the right time scale for these data. So we had a whole study on that already. Yeah. Are the electrons So yeah, so we typically put in, everything I showed you in those map examples were intracranial. So they were either stereotactic, all depths, or all grids. But we do have uh, people who get implanted with both. Um, and we actually don't need to do anything differently. Yeah. Yeah. So the con good. Yeah. So the stereo, the depth electrode technique, those contacts are smaller than the grid. So you are going to get more like a local field potential, hundreds to 
maybe thousand neurons. The other case, you're in thousands of neurons. So it's a it's a little bit of a different scale. Scalp is even. Uh, we don't. Yeah, I can show you what it does on scalp, but we really worked on this for the intracranial. Yeah. We change a every five, so the A matrix for a 500 millisecond window only makes sense for that window, and then it changes. We, there's no way, if you look at these time series, you cannot model a long window with a linear model. It won't work. Yeah. I'm going to do it at each. No, I'm going to show you right in the slide. I'll show you, and then if you still have questions. Violating the Nyquist theorem, you should be shifting it by sliding. Percentage of its length. Yeah, so we we've done that. So we've played with the width. We've played with sliding. It really doesn't change the map very much. So I agree that it will change the. Do you yeah. ever go into the frequency domain with the short time Fourier transform? To uh, to actually to to look at what to when you say go into the frequency to look There's at the a lot the of spectrogram. That you can't see in the time domain, but if right. You Yeah. There's a lot of information there. You can see the difference between noise and signal. You can see correlations you yeah. can't see in the time domain. We did it. And we did it for, we, 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 I don't know, if I, don't, I can show you offline. But yeah, so we compare this approach to everything that's been tried, which is exactly that. So people have done where they'll take the time series and they'll convert it. Typically in the neuro field, they like to think of frequency bands, alpha, theta, beta. So there's specific frequency bands of interest that they focus on, and they'll look at the power in those bands. And then they'll look at cross correlations between powers in those bands, and as well as coherence, cross power. All of that has been done. And all of that has been done to try to look for patterns that Right, oh no, they go to HFOs, high frequency oscillations, which go up to 30, 300 hertz and above. The problem is going even beyond 500 is the, a lot of acquisition systems won't capture the data as quickly as you want. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm just saying that's the limitation of the recordings, right? But you're, actually, I have a student who does rap models, and he's, I'm not an experimentalist, so he's doing this at Technion, and there you have like 20 kilohertz. And he found that at very ultra high frequency, right before seizure, you, it, he's more interested in predicting when something's about to happen well in advance so you can prevent. And it's happening, the high, ultra high is really uh, where you see things. But it, these impedances, are, are, you know, it's hard to put this into humans. So there's some technical limitations, all kinds of stuff. Um, okay, so how do we compute the fragility? So this is sort of the optimization problem we posed. So what we're looking for is given an A matrix and given that A, um, it doesn't have to be stable. So this is a general theory. I have an A matrix which has certain eigenvalues. And what I want to do is I want to add a perturbation delta to A to move those eigenvalues, or at least one of those, to a location I desire. Okay? So what this is doing, it's saying I want to find the minimum two induced normal delta such that A plus delta, lambda I, one of the eigenvalues, there exists at least one eigenvalue lambda I of A plus delta that hits lambda. And lambda can be something I impose. And if it's complex conjugate, of course, I need the other guy too. Okay? Um, and that lambda I of A is not, doesn't already have an eigenvalue there. Okay? Um, and so that's the problem we're trying to solve. How do you solve for that? So, and then we do this for, because we're interested in fragility of a node, right, and I want to compute this for each node, we have structure in the delta. So I'm not looking over all possible delta, real delta matrices. I'm looking for all possible delta matrices where I have one non-zero column. In the kth column, then I'm looking at the fragility of the kth node. Okay? I think I have, it. yeah, so how do we do this? Okay, so I'll go through a little bit of the derivation. So remember, I want an eigenvalue of A plus delta um, to be at some lambda that I specify. Now, I can write delta, since delta has this structure, 
I can write delta as, it's a rank one matrix, so I can write it as a column times a row, okay? And so what's that column? Gamma, so this new symbol gamma is the column in the delta that I wish to find, okay? And the row is just a 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, if it's where one is in the kth location, okay? So that's why this delta has been rewritten. So if lambda is an eigenvalue, that's just the equation, the definition of an eigenvalue, okay? And then if it's an eigen, I can bring it to the other side, determinant has to equal zero, and then I can do some tricks that you probably took in your graduate linear systems class or your matrix theory, where I can manipulate that determinant, and ultimately I get this constraint, a linear constraint on gamma, okay? That has to be satisfied for me to have the eigenvalue at lambda. Well, gamma is just a column vector, so the two-induced norm of that matrix is just the two-norm of gamma. So this is just a least squares, very simple least squares problem, okay? So instead of trying all those combinations, I just solve a least squares problem. Give me an A, and it's, it's computed less than, less than a second. Okay, so the process, just to summarize, so how do I get that map? I take my time series, when you're not having a seizure. You get the 500 millisecond window, you estimate your A, you do a perturbation for the ith column, you, you solve the, for the, the least squares problem, and you repeat. And you do this for all the nodes. You slide and you repeat. And that's how you get your map. Any questions on that? Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> does, does, does the system consistent when you change the time window? Um, so, uh, now, yeah. Yeah, so you'll see, yeah, so what, okay, so this was a related question I think uh, somebody was asking, how, how, how does the A change? So if you're far away from seizure, okay, so you're, when I say far away from a seizure event, um, at least three minutes uh, prior and before, okay? That's called interictal data, interictal recordings. You're kind of normal, you're really not in danger. In those cases, the A's are pretty steady. And when you look at the fragility maps, they just look like the same across, okay? But you'll see, you saw the maps I showed you. I showed you snapshots around seizures. And right before seizure, things are changing drastically, right? So the A's are changing. And so you might, I don't know if you were any of thinking like this, but I did compute fragility in a seizure. So what does that mean? So what we actually did is we pushed the eigenvalues not just on the margin, but further out. So even if I'm in seizure, I can still compute fragility because I'm saying, yeah, I know your eigenvalue's out, I'm going to push it out further, okay? And that's how we, that's why we actually compute it. Um, but we don't go beyond 500 milliseconds. We've done things like 100, 200, because the A matrix breaks down, meaning it's not linear beyond that window. It really isn't, okay? Meaning reconstruction. So not, uh, sorry? It doesn't, doesn't fit the data, yeah. Okay. So our hypothesis was the most, yeah? Yes, yes, we have unstable matrices during seizures, definitely. Oh, we just wanted to see, well, we don't compute the, we compute, we, we ask, I know your eigen, some of your eigenvalues are outside, we want to see what it takes to push you even further, okay? So it's still trying, I mean, we just wanted to keep computing and see what happens. What's interesting is you start seeing the spread the way the clinicians see the spread. I don't know if you saw that in some of the example maps, but you can actually start seeing where things are spreading, even by looking at that fragility during the seizure. Yeah. How do I define that? The units? Yo. Oh, because that's that comes from LTI, linear time invariant theory. So if I have a, a, a linear system that obeys x of t plus one equals a x of t, right? For my model. Um, I don't define it, it's the unit circle. It, I mean, I have a, a model, and, and for that type, those kinds of systems, there's a theory that says that model is stable if all the eigenvalues are inside a unit circle. That's just a theory, that it's not, we don't have to, we don't scale that, that's just, maybe we can talk offline, I can show you, yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Ah, no. That's interesting. the poles come in. So when you solve that equation, you'll get the poles, right? So you want to, pre when you say you, you but you said, I'm going to, I want to predict the next A. Try to minimize the error between the next A and the present A. Okay. And you find out what is that prediction, what are the coefficients of that prediction. So the, it's still a linear system of equations. Right. And so what if I am able to predict well? Then what do I do next? You know where the poles are. You can start to, the poles have to be inside the unit circle. And right. you can see where the poles are. And you right. So, but they don't, but the, okay, but, but the poles, go, so I can absolutely, and this has been done outside of our group, is somebody, they did build these linear models and they were looking at the poles. And they watch and the poles start moving out. But that doesn't tell you where the seizure starts. It's the timing, yeah. So it tells you something about when a seizure is about to happen, not where, right? How do I eval? Oh, we we look at things like minimum mean squared error, reconstruction error, like so. So, is that, no. Oh, so we don't predict when something starts. That is provided to us by clinical. We don't, we're not solving the problem of when do seizures start. So when I showed you these dashed lines, those were clinical annotations. Those are what the clinicians believed based on looking at the EEG. They think an electrographic onset is here. I say electrographic because it's different than what they call clinical onset, which is when they can actually see the behavior. Right, so in the brain, it, so that's all marked for us. We don't try to estimate that. But there's a whole field of people trying to come up with algorithms to detect when seizures happen. Yeah, sorry, one last. When you say that this is a, uh, the word practical is a tricky word, but if you you get different delta. Yeah, so, so yeah, for every node, I get a delta. I have a corresponding delta matrix for a given node, right? It's just its own nodes connections and how they change, that column of A. So yet, yeah, every node will have get a different delta that renders the network unstable. And that's exactly what the map is. So those that are red hot required a very small delta. Those were that were blue were big. How do you quantify how small the storm is how big the storm? Oh, we don't, we don't try. We just display the relative fragility to the clinician. We don't, we don't have an idea that 0.8 means anything. Yeah, yeah. I'm done. Oh, I'm done. I, well, you know what? I can stop here. The last statement I was I, here, I can stop here because we're almost we're done. The last statement I want to say is so um, we actually try to we we just completed a large retrospective study. So we got about 91 patients and over 300 seizure events, um, and we basically the what I won't go through, but. We, we went through a process of looking at our maps and looking at the clinical annotations, computing like a degree of agreement statistic, and looking at the distributions of that degree of agreement between successes and failures or clinical complexities. So it was a bit tedious, but just wanted, that's the last thing I was going to say. And it looks like fragility seems to be outperforming like frequency-based, spectral-based, correlation-based, high-frequency oscillation-based methods. Everything that's out there we tried in the same way, compared in the same way with the same data set. Um, and then I just wanted to get to my acknowledgments, and then I'll be done. Uh, I don't know how to jump to my last slide here. There we go. Where's uh, There. I just wanted to acknowledge. This I just want you to appreciate, and I think you know. Oh, sorry, you understand. The students understand they're working on it. It is really, really difficult to get information out of the clinical areas, right? I mean, we had 300 snapshots. For every snapshot, we needed to know what did the doctors say about that patient? Where did they think seizures start? Where did they think seizures spread? What did they actually do to the patient? Did the patient succeed or not? And, and there are lots of, anyways, we'll go, I think I'm over. So, just, so I just wanted to thank Jorge, and Adam is my patient. Jorge provided 40% of the data from Cleveland Clinic. He's a, a leader in the field. Cleveland Clinic does six of those implants a week. He used to do those. He's now at Pittsburgh. Anyways, and this is Adam Lee, my PhD student who did all the work. Yeah. Is this applicable to GALT EEGs or not? So yes, but it's not going to tell you 
this is where to take out. Yeah, but we do do it. I had a movie and stuff. But what we think, it, we did a study where we think it can help clinicians, guide clinicians as to where to implant. Not where it's something starting, but where should you focus your resources? Yeah. From scalpel, yeah, we do. Yeah. I mean, fragility just cares about the, it's a time series, right? But the meaning of it is very different depending on what you put in. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm out. Sorry, I think, yeah. Sabu, should we go to the next speaker maybe, or? I don't know. Sure. Maybe, but then, then I need a new theory of how to do the fragility. Uh, you're talking about, oh, you're talking about in general, like, the oh, oh, the whole window. Um, sure, but then I don't. Then I have to think about how I uh, analyze that model for this purpose, right? I mean, the nice thing about LTI is I can compute this thing, right? Switched in the sense that it's uh, oscillating between a stable linear system. Oh, okay. Okay, but it's not usually switching between two things. But you see, meaning it's depending on the patient and the type, it's, it's, there's a lot of interesting modes. And it, that some that are stable, some that are unstable, uh, even, or some that are critically stable. I mean, so it's, it's I'm not saying you can't do it, um, but it's tricky. It's just you'll have to, this, these data are very messy in general. Yeah, but yeah. Yes, we are going, we are trying, I think four out of the five centers have uh, agreed for release and so we are about to submit the paper, we're gonna release the data. So I'll, I'll let you know and uh, I'll absolutely, we think, because it's so nice because you have all the information you need to, to play with. Yes. Oh gosh, I don't know, you've gotta ask Adam that. <laughs> Any other, I think I'm good, right? Thank you so much, thank you.